Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Ocean Expert Exchange. Scientists in every Florida school and the Angeri Foundation are excited to have you join us for this live webinar today with ocean science and technology experts. In this monthly series, we dive into all things marine science and we explore what's happening in the field, interesting careers, and more. And today, we'll be speaking with Sarah Casaretto of the Marine Community and Behavioral Ecology Lab at Florida International University about the complex role sharks play uh, in marine ecosystems. First, though, we'd like to tell you just a little bit about our programs. Oops. The Scientist in Every Florida School program is a free program housed within the Thompson Earth Systems Institute at the University of Florida. The mission of CEFS is to engage Florida K-12 students and teachers in cutting edge research by providing science role models and experiences like today that we hope will inspire future stewards of, of our planet. The Anjari Foundation is a nonprofit headquartered in West Palm Beach, Florida, with the mission uh, and promotion of marine science research and education. And many of the foundation's primary initiatives involve its 65-foot research vessel, the RV Anjari. In case you missed it, uh, today's preview slides, you'll uh, find that we have um, some questions you can submit through to the scientists through typing in our chat box. And we'll also be um, asking for some feedback via a survey at the end of today's presentation. And we'd appreciate your taking part in that. So at this time, we would like to introduce you to Sarah, who's going to tell us a little bit more about herself, her research, and its significance. So Sarah, I'm going to go ahead and stop share and turn things over to you at this time. Awesome. Thank you, Stephanie. Now it's my turn to try to fight with the share button and all things technological. Uh, let's see. Really quickly. Screen. All right. Um, I believe everyone should be able to see my screen now. Looks yes. Good. Perfect. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm super excited to talk a little bit about my research um, and a little bit about myself and discussing how my research looks at sharks as not just a predator, but also prey. Uh, so, first things first, a little bit about me. Um, as Stephanie mentioned earlier, my name is Sarah. I was originally born in Maryland, kind of right in between Baltimore and Washington, D.C., and I've always been passionate about the ocean and exploring it. I began scuba diving when I was 11 years old, and I saw my first shark underwater not long after that, and uh, you can say I was hooked right after. Um, I started volunteering at the National Aquarium in Baltimore, learning as much as I could about different ocean habitats, ecosystems, and all the different animals. Uh, I went to the University of Tampa for my uh, degree, and I got a double major in biology and marine science with a chemistry minor. And shortly after that, I joined the Marine Community and Behavioral Ecology Lab here at Florida International University, where I look at the sort of factors that influence the behavior and decision making of sharks in these coastal ecosystems. So let's jump right into it. Talking about these coastal ecosystems, one thing that we cannot mention enough is that our world is changing. Some of these changes are due to natural causes and others are made worse or only caused by human influence. And through this changing world, we see that there are a lot of efforts in order to mitigate or manage these consequences to not only the habitats themselves, but all the, the animals that may be at risk or affected by the change that is happening. This includes both terrestrial and aquatic animals. However, to really efficiently respond to the ecosystem and the people's needs, we as scientists and people who do coastal management really need to understand what drives animal behavior and influences the choices that animals make when they're occupying different habitats or ecosystem so that we can appropriately manage and conserve different species at different scales. The skill in the coastal habitat that I'm specifically interested in is over on the west coast of Florida, just south of Naples, um, and that is called the Rookery Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. And the Rookery Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve is a, covers and protects about 110,000 acres of wetland and coastal waters. Uh, real quickly, uh, the, I know many of us may know what an estuary is, but for those of us who don't, an estuary is a geographic region where fresh and salt water mix and meet. And this creates a really unique environment where we get animals and plants that are freshwater and saltwater 
potentially converging and combining and being able to interact and kind of mesh in their worlds, which is really cool. Uh, the Rookery Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve is much like any other park or a protected area that we might find here in Florida, but it also is set aside to allow for scientists such as myself to conduct research. So that way we can better use the knowledge that we get from reserves such as this to protect coastal and wetland areas all across the, the state and the country. So a little bit more about the reserve. Um, it is coastal. Uh, it includes freshwater streams and channels that empty into small bays. These bays then give way to shallow brackish, which means a mix of salt and fresh water, and lots of mangrove lined islands, which we now know, which we call the 10,000 islands down in Florida, opening up into the coastal Gulf of Mexico. This system is dominated by these mangrove islands and is mainly combined with muddy and sandy bottom habitats. I specifically within the reserve am focusing my research within this white box area, the southeasternmost part of the reserve. And the reason for this is that this part of the reserve has had a huge um, impact, human impact, causing a different in their hydrological histories uh, that allows me to compare neighboring different systems. And for those of you who don't know what hydrological means, it just means that there is a change in the way that water flows and how and what kind of water fresh versus salt should be in the system. So if we zoom in a little bit further, we see here in a pink box, a series of canals. Um, in the 1940s and 50s, there was a lot of housing development that happened here in South Florida. And one such development that occurred was a creation of these canals. Um, the three bays directly below these canals are Pumpkin Bay, Faca Union Bay, and Fakahatchee Bay. Due to these canals being created, there has been a disruption in the way that water would naturally flow. Water was being diverted from Pumpkin Bay going into those small canals up above and was being pumped straight into Faca Union Bay directly below all those smaller canals. This results in Pumpkin Bay being freshwater deprived or saltier than it should be, with Faca Union being freshwater inundated or a little bit more fresh than it should be. In fact, Hatchie Bay directly to the east of those two bays, despite being super close, has relatively remained the same in terms of its salinity levels which creates an awesome system where we can directly compare how animals might react to changes in the salinity. There is ongoing restoration efforts called the Picayune Shore and Restoration Project. And this began in 2007 with the goal to restore the system back to its natural water flow. It is projected for completion in 2024. However, as we know, things sometimes get shifted back. And so with my research ongoing currently, we are able to see how these restoration efforts might cause shifts in the behavior of the animals that call this home. Even with all this human influence that has been ongoing in the estuary, the Rookery Bay area is bustling with animal life and has a complex food web, much like the one shown here. And sharks play a very important part of the food web, acting as a predator to many of the organisms found in the estuary. But we're, one of the things that I'm interested in is that some of these sharks might also be prey to other sharks or bigger sharks. So let's dive right in to the different sharks that can be found in the reserve. So far with my work, I've caught a variety of different sharks. I've seen great hammerheads, tiger sharks, smaller sharks such as sharp nose and black nose sharks. It is very diverse. And all of these different sharks are sharing the same waters. But the four most common shark species that have been seen in the reserve are also the ones that might be using this preserve as a nursery or an area for these juvenile sharks to spend their time. And that is these four sharks here. The bull shark, which has a very high tolerance for fresh water. The bonnet head shark, which is the smallest uh, hammerhead shark in the world. The lemon shark and the black tip shark. So my big question looking at all the sharks in the area is, how are these juvenile sharks in the reserve living together? And what influences the way that they use the waters in the reserve? So here we have nine zones that I'm doing all my research in. Zones one, two, and three are those bays we mentioned earlier, Pumpkin Bay, Faca Union, and Fakahatchee. And then we broke it down further into different habitats, extending out from the backwater bays to mangrove islands to the coastline, and then following also in a uh, underneath the actual drainage basin. Is it the mangrove habitat directly below Pumpkin, or is it the mangrove habitat directly below Fakahatchee Bay? 
And I want to see what sort of factors affect the decision making and where the juvenile sharks might be spending their time within these zones. One such factor is the factor of risk. Risk is the probability of something bad happening, but simply. And risk is very important. We undertake risk assessment every single day. When we go to cross the street, we look left, we look right, we make sure there's no speeding traffic, we make sure it's safe for us to cross. Animals do the exact same thing. They look to see, is the area too risky for them to spend their time in? Is there a reason they should go and take a risky behavior, such as, is that Dunkin' Donuts that makes your coffee just the right way across the busy street? Okay, then it might be worth crossing that street. Animals engage in the same sort of behavior, thinking about what is worth risk and how can they avoid risk while still getting other sort of goals or engaging in other behaviors they might want to do. So to figure out how risky these nine zones are, I'm using a specific type of fishing method called a drum line. And I, will de I deploy a multiple of these drum lines at one time, and each one has a single hook that is attached to a bottom set weight with a swivel that goes all the way to the top gun with a float so we can retrieve it. What's cool about the drum line is that because the line is on a swivel, if a shark is captured successfully, they're able to keep swimming. And that reduces the stress or any issues we might have with the animal, making it a lot safer for the animal and for us. We then are going to look at the catch rates that we get using these drum lines across these nine zones to help us figure out how risky or how many of these larger sharks are we catching in the reserve? And does that change based off of the habitat or what bay we are directly underneath its drainage area? So what sort of sharks have we caught big sharks? Here is an example of one of these large sharks. This is a, a female bull shark that we captured um, right along the coastline. She was over two meters, which means she was over about six and a half feet long. Um, and when we capture the shark, we safely secure it. We measure the shark and then we take any other samples we might need. And I'll talk a little bit about the samples I collect a little bit later. So we are currently ongoing and we are actively uh, drumlining in the reserve. And we began in January of this year. So I'm super excited. It's been almost a full year of us fishing. And I plan to continue until January of 2025. So we're now figuring out how risky these zones are, but we also need to know the other side how and where the juveniles are spending their time within these zones. And that leads us to these beautiful mangroves that are dominating the estuary system. As we can see here, mangrove roots are like a maze. And if you are a small shark, this can provide a sort of refuge or a say, think of it like in tag, the home base that you can go to. And if I was a small shark and I'm trying to avoid being eaten, I might change how far away from this refuge I'm willing to swim based on how risky the area is. So to do this, I'm using a different method with long lines, set one long line close to the mangroves and one long line further from the mangroves to see whether we catch more juvenile sharks close by to the mangrove islands or far from the mangrove islands. And I wanna look and see if these catch rates vary based off of how risky these zones are using the drumline data or if how many of these juvenile sharks we catch changes based off of how risky it is overall. So we're talking about risk and how that affects behavior. But if I was a juvenile shark, I'm not just interested in not getting eaten. I also need to worry about getting food myself. I have to think about eating enough food to survive. We know that we have these juvenile sharks that are sharing this estuary water. So the big question is, are the sharks sharing resources? Are they using different resources? Are they feeding on different things? And does this change based off of time of year or where they are in the reserve? To figure that out with every shark we capture, both juvenile and the larger individuals, I collect different samples. Um, some of the samples I collect are a muscle sample, a fin clip, and a blood sample. And I'm able to do a chemical analysis to help us figure out where and what the shark may be feeding on in broad terms. It can help us generally figure out, are they feeding in the backwater bays? Are they feeding in the coastline? And where they're feeding, are they feeding at the top of the food web? Or are they somewhere more in the middle of the food web? Combining all of this data, we can start to tease out whether the fear of being eaten or the risk or the need to eat is more important for these juvenile sharks when they're choosing where to swim and where to spend their time. So why does this matter? Like I mentioned earlier, coastal ecosystems are changing rapidly. 
Some of these changes are salinity changes, such as what we see here in the Rookery Bay area. But other changes are sea level rise and coastal development, houses being built, and other human influences such as pollution and fishing. And there's a lot of ongoing interest by governments and local managers to restore and protect a lot of these habitats, knowing how the animals that call these coastal habitats home are going to respond to the different factors is very important for us to effectively conserve and manage um, these habitats and meet the targets for restoration. And it also helps us scientists predict how animals such as juvenile sharks or even the larger adult sharks might respond to future changes um, as our coastal systems and coastal habitats continue to change and develop. With that being said, none of my work would be possible without all the amazing sponsors and supporters I have. FIU, um, Marco Island Shell Club, the Friends of Rookery Bay, the Rookery Bay Reserve, Alpha Chi Omega, NSF, National Italian American Foundation, um, and without all of you guys being interested in our research. Uh, with that being said, I'm happy to take any questions now. And also, if any of you guys are curious, you're well, welcome to reach out to me on my Instagram, my science communication Instagram, Blue Waves found on Instagram. Yep, thank you so much. Excellent, thank you so much. We really appreciate you sharing your, your insight with us, your experience and the work that you're doing. Uh, we're gonna switch over now to the question and answer portion of today's Ocean Expert Exchange. So if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and write them in the Zoom chat or the YouTube chat, wherever you're tuning in from. We're gonna go ahead and start with a comment from Chris who says, she knows that you mentioned that you're coming up on your one year mark for your Rickery Bay research. Do you have any results or findings that you're able to share with us today? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so far, I don't have anything in a graph to show you guys, but I can tell you that with the preliminary analysis that I've done so far, statistically, we're seeing that we are catching more of these larger sharks in the coastal habitat. So let me, uh, Brian, I'm gonna share my screen one more time just so I can show the maps. I know not everyone necessarily can remember the zones off the top of their head. They haven't been staring at it for a year straight like I have. Um, so if we look at these nine zones, we are finding so far that we've been catching more of these larger sharks, the ones that um, play a more predator role for these juveniles in zone seven through nine. Uh, this might partly be due to the fact that it's deeper waters there, but also um, this area is very tidally influenced. So the back bays are not very easily accessible if you're a larger shark, just because during lows um, tide, you just can't swim back there. They can't make it back there. So if I were, we're gonna continue and we're gonna work on our fishing with the juvenile sharks, but I'm expecting to see more juvenile sharks spending their time in these back zones to avoid those larger sharks that are spending time along the coastline. Thank you, thank you so much. We'll continue with Rosanna uh, who read somewhere that juvenile lemon sharks were known for cooperative hunting. Do you know if this is true? Um, juvenile lemon sharks do spend their time together. They are one of the sharks that we have a lot of actual really cool research on in terms of seeing how they behave from very, very small, which we call neonates when they're just born, young of year and juveniles um, because of some amazing work that's been done in the Bahamas. And they've been found that these juvenile sharks will actually separate themselves based off of size classes because larger juveniles will actually eat smaller juvenile sharks. So although they might engage in some cooperative hunting, they're also sometimes worried about larger juveniles predating on them themselves. So it really is a shark meat shark world, even in the nursery. Sure. Our next question is, um, are there other areas in the world where you see similar estuarine setup to study sharks? Yeah, so one of the great things about um, Florida is that it's covered in estuary systems and an estuary doesn't have to be a tropical or warm water estuary. I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm from Maryland and we have this huge estuary called the Chesapeake Bay um, estuary system up there. And although the different animals might be different, it may not be the exact same species of crabs or sharks or fish, the mix inflow of the different animals we find are there. We do see a huge difference in the type of plants. For example, if the further north you go, you still have an estuary, but it may not be mangrove dominated. You get more of those marsh grasses and um, different types of trees. Mangroves are a lot more uh, tropical. They need warmer waters. Thank you. 
Don asks, what is the rarest shark you have ever caught? Um, the rarest shark I've ever caught, if we look at it in terms of like classification globally, um, if any of you are unfamiliar, there's the IUCN red list, which is a global and local classification of the status of different animals, including terrestrial and aquatic. I'd say that I have had the privilege to successfully and safely work with great hammerhead sharks through uh, my owners of project and others, and they are listed criti as critically endangered globally. So it's been amazing to get to see these animals. Our, our next question is, how do you determine whether a shark you catch is juvenile or an adult? That's a great question. Um, it depends a little bit on the species, uh, but we look at the size. So for some size sharks, if they're very, very small, let's say we're looking at a juvenile bull shark, when they're first born, they might actually have a little cut on their stomach that is indicative of that they are just recently born, kind of like imagine an umbilical scar with people. And that does feel as they get older. But the biggest way we can tell is with size. Once we can ID the species, we can know, okay, they don't actually become mature until they reach this certain length. And that varies. As I mentioned, sharp-nosed sharks reach maturity when they're still less than three feet versus a tiger shark that's less than three feet is most definitely still a juvenile. Excellent. Thank you so much. Emily is curious if you think climate change will move their zones and if they will start to move to other colder coastlines. That's a great question, Emily. I absolutely think that is the case. We see it already. We've seen it with other animals. We even see it with terrestrial animals and we've seen it with plants even. As the restrictions that can confine an animal based off of what they can tolerate gets broader, these animals and plants are gonna move. I mentioned mangroves earlier. They are going further north because as water is warm and as average air temperatures even warm up, we're seeing mangroves able to safely propagate and grow in areas where they never had before. And we're seeing other animals, including sharks and other fish, swimming to waters that previously they weren't able to access or wouldn't prefer to swim in, but now they can because it's nice and toasty. Interesting. We have uh, students tuning in today from Sumter County, Florida, who want to know how big the sharks in these zones you mentioned earlier can get. That's a great question. Um, actually, we just uh, successfully uh, captured and did a workup on the biggest shark so far that for my research in this area, just uh, on Sunday, this past Sunday, we were just fishing there and it was a tiger shark about 3.5 meters, which is a little over 11 feet. So that wow. was a big female tiger shark. Wow. And next we have Caitlin who wants to know what sharks eat besides fish. That's a cool question. Um, sharks are very diverse. Uh, some sharks like to eat crustaceans. A lot of some sharks prefer to feed on crabs, lobsters. We have some sharks that prefer to feed on squid. Their teeth are even designed more to feed on squid, like they're pointier and they're better to grip that slipperiness. And then um, as some of us might know, we have sharks that prefer to feed on uh, marine mammals such as seals and sea lions. And then we do have some sharks such as the great hammerhead that preferentially feed on sharks and rays. They prefer to feed on stingrays and other sharks. So sort of piggybacking off that question, Alan's wondering what the small sharks that are in the mangroves are eating. Yeah, they'll be eating smaller fish. So there are lots of really small fish. Some of them might be eating this tons of little pink shrimp that we know hang out in this estuary. So some of these sharks might be eating those pink shrimp. Uh, the bonnet heads might be feeding on the crabs that they see there, as might the other sharks actually. Um, or even potentially eating the mussels and the clams. Uh, I always like to say that although sharks do have potential, might have preferences for what they wanna eat, uh, a lot of the times if they can fit their mouth around it, they're going to be happy with whatever they catch. Sure. Joyce would like to know if you ever get scared working with sharks. So I don't necessarily get scared. I do kind of like if I were to go in the African safari, I respect sharks as a predator. I recognize that they are absolutely amazing animals and they're very strong. And there is a reason that they actually haven't changed evolutionarily for millions of years because they're good at what they do. They're good at being a shark. And so when I go out, we have a lot of safety procedures in place. We do things very safely. 
we always prioritize the safety of the crew and the safety of the animal before anything else that we do. So as long as I stick to that, and I have some amazing scientists who help me out. So I feel very confident in our ability to do everything safely. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Jessica asks, what percent of sharks in this area do you think were born here versus came in at some point? I don't know the an answer to that off the top of my head. I couldn't give you a percent. However, I can definitely tell you that there are quite a few animals. Florida is a hot spot um, in the sense that we have such good management of our coastal waters. And we have so many protected areas from the Everglades and state parks and research reserves such as Rookery Bay that we've created this area where lots of fish and lots of animals can safely grow and be juveniles. There's a lot of um, juvenile bull shark nurseries in Florida. And we know that they like to spend their time there and that they, after they get to a certain size, they will then leave. But there has been cases in which those larger adults will come back, um, hmm. so which is pretty cool. Interesting. Valerie wonders if you've noticed that males and females have distinct behaviors. I haven't noticed necessarily behavior yet. And that is something that I will analyze when I'm doing my statistical analysis. I do plan to look and see if we see a difference in where the male and females are spending their time. Because there has been research that has shown that some species of sharks will separate themselves based off of the sex. Mr. Allison's class wonders if you ever catch the same shark twice and what you do if you see that shark again. Yeah. Uh, so that's what we call a recapture. And I, for with the fishing that I've done, have not yet caught one of the same individuals that I have fished. That being said, it does happen. It's not as often as you may think. And if it does happen, it'd actually be really cool because it gives us the opportunity to resample the animal. So when I capture the sharks, I tag the sharks. So they each have their own special number. We basically give them a little piercing and it has a number on it. So if I catch it, I can know, oh, this is a shark that I caught in June. And one of the cool things is if we do recapture it, we can take the samples again and we can actually do the same chemical analysis and see if their diet has changed or see how much it's grown since the last time we caught it, which is a pretty cool opportunity. Definitely. Jessica points out that the structure of mangrove roots probably makes it very difficult for bigger sharks to enter and exit those backwater zones. And is wondering if you find sharks in sizes you did not expect in these areas. That's a great question, Jessica. Um, so far, yes, I have actually, they were still juveniles in the sense that they were not mature, but I've caught some relatively larger juvenile lemon sharks in these back bays. And I was a little surprised. I wasn't expecting as many of them to be in the back bays. But one of the cool things about this area is that although there's a lot of flat and um, shallow parts and lots of mangrove islands that can be hard to swim through, it's connected through a series of channels. So some of these sharks might be able to get back there during high tide or following a particularly deep channel. Uh, we have Mason and Charlotte who want to know what your favorite shark is and how many of those you have caught for observation and research. It's a great question. I love that. Um, my favorite shark is the great hammerhead shark, um, mainly because they are so derpy looking with that head shape. Um, we call that a cephalofoil, the, the specific head shape for the hammerhead. Um, and they're just very beautiful, very graceful animals in the water, which is surprising when you look at them, you wouldn't think they would move so fast or be such efficient predators. Um, and how many I've caught, I've been very fortunate to work with some amazing scientists through both my own research and other people's projects. And I've been able to safely work with probably over 10 great hammerheads at this point. However, uh, there can never be too many in my mind. <laughs> uh, Valerie asks if, if you take into account the type of bait you use and how that might influence what you will catch. Yeah, we do actually do that. I always, so we use particularly uh, bloody and oily bait because sharks have a really good sense of smell. And so we want to be able to attract them and let them know that the bait is there. So I will use any bloody oily fish such as bonita, barracuda, or mullet, and that can really help us attract them. We do always make a note of what type of bait we're using, as well as what part of the fish it is, whether it's the head or the middle or the tail, because we do have to cut it up 
so we can put it on the hook. And that's something that we do look at and we keep as part of our statistical analysis to see, are these sharks being pickier than, than we think? Uh, Mr. Allen's class wants to know, do any of these sharks eat their own kind? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Absolutely. Um, there has been documented predation of lemon sharks on other lemon sharks. Uh, so we do know that, that there is sharks that will feed on uh, same members of the same species. Interesting. Uh, some viewers are curious about the behaviors of different species of sharks. And if you see differences in aggression, feeding, et cetera, between species. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I can even talk about the diving that I've done with animals. Uh, I've done dives for both research and filming and even just for my own personal fun uh, weekend getaways. And for example, I've gone on dives where I've seen both lemon sharks and bull sharks. And the lemon sharks are very bold. They're very curious. They have no concept of personal space. They will swim right into your bubble and just swim right past you. They're not worried at all. And I've actually seen the bull sharks, on the other hand, are very shy when you're on a dive. They like to stay far away, especially if there's lemon sharks. They're like, I don't want to deal with the sassy lemon sharks. I'm going to stay my distance. I'll just hang out over here and not bother anybody. Um, and then we talk about even different sharks that do eat different things and spend their time in different parts of the water column. A nurse shark is going to spend more time just hanging out at the bottom, potentially hiding under a reef or in a hole versus a Caribbean reef shark that we're going to watch and see swimming, being a lot more active, potentially cruising around or engaging in more hunting things rather than sitting and waiting like a nurse shark would. Thank you. Alex asks, what is the biggest shark you've seen in Rookery Bay? Oh, yeah. Um, so I did mention that we caught that really large tiger shark this past weekend, but I've also seen a very large great hammerhead shark that we did not capture because it just didn't bite on our drum line, but we did get to see it from the boat. So we know that there are big sharks out there and they are definitely um, interested in spending their time in those coastal waters. Sure. Reid wonders how many different species of sharks you have caught in your work. Oh, great question. Uh, if you had asked me a few days ago, I would have told you six and now it's seven. <laughs> um, oh, because oh. this past tiger shark we caught was our first tiger shark in the reserve. Um, we are entering a new season, so that play a role in it. Uh, we also had all those heat waves of the summer, so it might have affected where these tiger sharks wanted to spend their time as water's cool. Um, so I'm excited to tease that data apart and see, since we're doing two years, that's why I'm fishing until 2025. I can compare if this is a pattern that happens every season or if this was something that we only see in one year. Valerie's wondering if you see different distributions for males and female sharks. For example, maybe females would be closer to mangroves to give birth. So with the ones that we're finding in the reserve, a large majority of them are juveniles, which means that they aren't actually uh, mature yet. So they're not looking to mate. They're not looking to reproduce yet. Uh, and if they, if a larger shark is coming into the estuary to pup, um, it's going to be a much larger individual. So they're probably just going to access as far in as they can safely get, safely pup, and then leave the area, especially they might even choose to go in with high tide. But with the ones that are spending their time and hanging out in those back bays or in the mangrove channels, even though some of them are on the larger side, like six, seven feet, they're still uh, juveniles, which means that they're not being driven by that drive to mate or reproduce. Thank you. We have time for just a few more questions. Our next one is from John, who wants to know, what type of education do you need to do the research that you do? It's a great question, John. Um, I'm currently working on my PhD. So in order to get to a PhD level, you do need to get a, a bachelor's. Uh, and honestly, it really depends on what you're mainly interested in. I chose to do a bachelor's that had a biology and a marine science component because I knew I was very interested in marine science. However, if you're someone who's just interested in science in general and conservation in general, you could always just choose, oh, I'm gonna do environmental science or I'm just gonna do general biology and then figure out specifically where you wanna do your research. And one of the things I can suggest is if you have the opportunity, work with labs at a university, volunteer at aquariums, volunteer with reserves such as Rickery Bay. Rickery Bay does take volunteers for their ongoing uh, research for their trawl programs. And they take high school students, they take adults, they take, we have people who come 
and are retired and they spend their time um, volunteering with the reserve and it's absolutely amazing. So this question may overlap with that one just a little bit, bit, but since we have so many students in attendance today, I'm curious what advice you would give them if they were interested in working in science once they graduate in the future. Yeah, I the biggest piece of advice I can give you, it sounds kind of cliche, but is really don't be afraid to hear no. Pitch yourself out there, apply to internships, apply to a lot of internships, apply to things that you're interested in, but maybe are not super sure about, get more information, reach out to other scientists. Every scientist I know is super happy to share their research and share how they got there and have conversation. So if you meet a scientist or see someone on Instagram, reach out to them, ask them those questions, volunteer with different organizations and really put yourself out there. Because if you don't ask, the answer is definitely no. And if you do ask, the answer might be yes. Well, Sarah, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you and learning from you. So thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you joining us this afternoon. I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to Stephanie to wrap up today's event. Thanks, Brian. And thank you so much, Sarah. I'm just popping up uh, our slides once again for all the folks online with us. We wanna thank everyone for joining us today. And again, a special thank you to Sarah for sharing her work and passion uh, for Sharks with us. If you'd like to take a look at some of the K-12 extension activities and resources we have related to today's topic, you can find those made available along with a recording of today's session on the UF Earth Systems YouTube channel. And we would also ask that you again, please take a moment to complete the survey link, which is now located in the chat box. Um, Finally, if you would like more information about the Scientist in Every Florida School Program or Anjari Foundation, you can visit our websites and follow us on social media as seen here on the screen. And for this particular fall semester, we have just one more Ocean Expert Exchange coming up. On November 30th, we'll be discussing the secrets of sargasm with Dr. Brian Lapointe of Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute at Florida Atlantic University. And we hope that you'll join us for that, that visit as well. So with that, again, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us on today's event, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And we look forward to seeing you at future Ocean Expert Exchanges. Thanks, everyone. <music>